Good afternoon. I hope you had a nice coffee and you are still awake on a Friday afternoon. Um, I'm Ludwig Müller. I'm the director of SP in Vienna, as just introduced. And before I introduce the panel, maybe a few words on the report. And I would like to say one thing up front. This is a small policy report. It is addressed to policymakers, if you like. But uh, I think it is important to understand, after all the technical discussions we had, uh, the value of engineering that is represented also by this institution, that the link to policy is important. Myself, I am an engineer, and I see the link and the importance from the engineering side also into politics. And we'll see in a minute why this is important. So this group, uh, this uh, report from the high-level advisory group, HLUC in short, has been published uh, end of March. It has been put together by a group of uh, high-level people, uh, former ministers, C-level executives from industries, uh, former Secretary General NATO, to give you an idea. People uh, from the outside the space sector uh, on purpose to get a perspective beyond space. Uh, as mentioned, Isa DG made a reference to it and also Samantha, our um, astronaut, Italian astronaut, or one of the Italian astronauts, um, made uh, an introduction to it. Now, one thing very clearly up front, this is not about the panelists and us. It is not about governments, it's not about industry, and it is not about agencies. It's really a report that addresses many of you in the room here, because this is a report on the future, future generations to have a policy decision base for programs that really will carry us forward and that ensure that we can continue to develop the tal talents as you have it at Politecnico di, di Torino and um, to see this really as an enabling element. And this doesn't happen every year. It's probably a unique uh, point in time. There are things in the report. I highlight one, trust the young is explicitly mentioned and the importance to ensure also the talent evolution in Europe. It is also more, to be precise, for them, those who are familiar with Artemis uh, uh, Accords, it's more than an Artemis generation. This is about a space generation. It is inclusive, and it should include a strong European place. It is also something that is triggered by exploration, but it is more than space exploration. The group came to the conclusion that this is about the whole package of space. Exploration is a critical element in it, but it is more than just this. It is also more than just a space program. This is about prosperity, to have really the capabilities in Europe to do the things we need, to also have the techno technological progress to bring us forward. Uh, ultimately, also a matter of European identity and values. The report looks into three things. For those that uh, had the time to read it, or if not, please, uh, I encourage you to do so, to look into societal benefits, in terms of inspiration, economic benefits, in terms of people talk about a one trillion economy in the 2040s of space, but also really put it into the bigger benefit of uh, society, space for society, not only space economy, but space for the economy. And then you talk about percentages of GDP in terms of impact. Uh, maybe comparable to uh, what the internet did 20 years ago, what today AI is, we believe space is equally transformative. And last but not least, after societal, economical, the geopolitical aspect, this is about a place of Europe in an increasingly multipolar world. We have, obviously, we have the US as the leading big player. We have China uh, stepping up. We have India. We have others. And the real question is, where is the place of Europe? And Samantha made this clear yesterday. The report is also not titled Evolution. In fact, it was a discussion when the, the title was decided. It is called Revolution, so it really calls for change. It's not a linear next step. It is more than this. Um, and um, it will be one point we will address also here in the panel. Um, ultimately, it is a call for policy actions. And each of you is really called to maybe participate in this and where you can to help in this debate beyond the parameter of what we are as engineers and all the good things we already do in space system developments to make this understood, people aware in policy that make the decisions on future programs. This is the key requirement uh, one could argue today. It's certainly the main point the report is making. 
This has never been done at this level uh, before in a concerted action in Europe. In the 60s, there was a Cold War situation when Apollo came up on the moon landing. Today, there is a new rush to the moon, if you like, but it's also happening in what now is also a commercial race. So we have the geopolitical element still, but you have the commercial and that is new. And that changes the whole formula. So we're talking about public and private action together. It's about now. It's not about tomorrow. It's not about in five years. This is a race where you have increasing number of nations, spacefaring nations engaging, increasing numbers of nations that have the ambition to become a space power, to have an autonomy and to have the means to actually act in orbit. We have an increase in venture capital invest this last year. We exceeded one billion in Europe, to give you an idea. And equally, also the public spending has increased and we are above 100 billion as we speak. Europe's share in this is 15%, to give you an idea. So we're relatively small. If we compare Europe to, to the uh, American investments, I think the ratio when it comes to exploration in particular is 1 to 17. It gives you an idea of the scale. Um, I, I just want to re-emphasize the commercial element in it. Uh, you know that in space now you have people like Amazon investing billions. You have Elon Musk that everybody knows, and it's not only rockets, it's also satellites and connectivity. So this is really a, a time that we did not have any time before. And I conclude just to say what we want to address in the panel. It's really three aspects. How do policymakers deal with this question? And we have Elena Grifoni. Elena, welcome. And uh, I think she will give us uh, a perspective from really a policy angle. Secondly, uh, you will see the report calls for um, industrial transformation. And we have uh, three representatives from industry, Wolfgang Dürer, um, head of marketing and sales, space exploration, Airbus, defense and space. Um, Walter Cugno, vice president, exploration and science domain, Thales Alenia Space Italia and uh, Timo Stufler, Stufler, Director of Business Development and Exploration, OHB. Welcome. And uh, we will be interested to hear from you also the industry's perspectives. And the third element is the agency view and how agencies, and in that case also particularly uh, ESA, is preparing for the next step. And we have from CNES, uh, we have um, Jean-Marc uh, Astor. Welcome, uh, Jean-Marc. And we have uh, Didier Schmidt. You are a bit hidden in the slide, but uh, I think most people will know you, Didier, from ESA, who uh, is the strategy and coordination group leader for uh, robotic and human exploration. Uh, with this, I would like to dive into the panel. It will be dense, and we have uh, quite uh, a few panelists and contributions that we're looking forward to see. I would like to open the debate with a single shorter statement of each of the panelists, very short, before we go into specific, more specific questions, on how they feel about the report. And uh, I would suggest we do the tour de table as we go, and we start with Elena, please. You want me to come over there? No, you t uh, take, take the microphone, and I will join you also on the... Yes, yes. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Ludwig, and a special thanks to Jean-Jacques Dordain, who is uh, the person who reached out to, to get me here, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm very honored to be here today. So what, uh, uh, what is the impression about the H-LAG? Uh, the H-LAG report is an important report, and it's uh, certainly timely, and it's certainly something that was highly due. Now, why? I think that uh, you have all uh, heard it many, many times. We are living in a true space revolution. Uh, we have seen this. Uh, we have heard about uh, comparison with what was, was the Internet revolution 20 years ago. It is true. Uh, this is what is happening. But what is even more important or interesting in this specific case, in the case of the H lag, is that the space revolution, if you want, is hitting or more visible in the exploration sector because thanks to the revolution brought by private companies like SpaceX in transportation, 
thanks to the decrease of the cost to bring kilograms into orbit, there is a new low Earth orbit, moon, uh, outer space bodies economy that is truly opening. And therefore we are on the verge of a, of a, of a new uh, economy and world and continents that, uh, that needs to be reached and reaped. So this is uh, extremely important and very interesting and Europe has to take its position on this. Now, where does, I can only speak for Italy of course, so where does Italy stand uh, into this? There is no need to say it, but I say it anyway. Uh, I'm sure you all know that uh, Italy has a very long and uh, strong history in uh, exploration. Uh, we have always invested and engaged uh, in exploration since the very beginning, not only in exploration, but also in, uh, in uh, transportation. And thanks to that, we have really developed a, a vibrant, a very strong industry. We have here a representative uh, from uh, 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 Thales Salenia Space, but I would also like to mention Avio uh, for space transportation, which is another key element and enabling element of uh, uh, the, the, the space revolution and the exploration revolution, let me call it in this way. So Italy has always invested, exploration is important for Italy, uh, together with transportation and Earth observation is one of our three key pillars and it's not a novelty. Uh, we have always been very coherent uh, throughout the years, maintaining, if you want, uh, the, the, the roadmap focused on these three key elements. So for this reason, uh, we absolutely believe that uh, this report was due. Uh, it is very interesting. The real work starts now uh, because uh, we need to understand and discuss with the other politicians around uh, the table, around the European table, uh, and understand how to move from a very inspirational report to something concrete, which is a program. And this is the, the work that we have ahead of us between now uh, and November with the Space Summit. Thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, I would maybe ask uh, Wolfgang if you, just as an opening statement, and then we go into questions later. Yes, uh, thank you, Ludwig, again, for the invitation, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. So, uh, congrats to the high-level advisory group uh, on this report, Revolution in Space. I guess this is on the spot, since we are not just in an evolution, we are really in a revolution, what is currently going on. We are transforming heavily in the space sector, and this is going by a speed which was not uh, thinkable a couple of years ago. Uh, also because of a lot of pressure which is coming from the US, uh, from the involvement of the, uh, or increasing involvement of the commercial sector. And we in Europe have also to be visionary, to make our mind how, what kind of position do we wanna keep or do we wanna gain in future in this environment which is really transforming very fast. It is, I would say, a kind of golden age or golden decade of space and especially of space exploration when we see what's going on currently, uh, the establishment or the uh, development of a, of a moon economy, what's going on in the transportation sector. Um, Starship will be a game changer in my point of view. Uh, if it will uh, happen and it will happen, this is uh, not a question uh, of the if, it's a question of time. And so a lot is changing and we have to really find our position in Europe and therefore the report of the High Level Advisory Group is very important. It is on the spot. We have to thank Josef Aschbacher from ESA who is really a driver behind it with the Human Spaceflight Inspirator topic. Uh, it was announced more or less last year at the Space Summit. Uh, then the High Level Advisory Group was put in place. They came up now with this important report and it's now on us, on all of us, not just on the agencies or on industries, on all of us to support and to provide this message to our uh, member states, to the governments, to get this done, to get a buy-in of our uh, heads of agencies or head of uh, government in the summit this year and the next one is next year and then we are heading towards the next ministerial conference where we hopefully see some programmatic uh, 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 or so, so some programs which then will put everything in place. So it's really 
on the spot, and uh, I just repeat uh, one of the sentences which really describes it very well. We have to act visionary, we have to act differently, and at uh, most we have to act now and very fast. Thank you, Wolfgang. So that, that was a, a nice uh, highlight of what, in fact, is one of the key messages as well. Uh, Jean-Marc, please. Thank you, Ludwig. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, the EAA for organizing this conference because this is at the perfect timing uh, between the ASHLAG report and the Sevilla summit uh, during which uh, the human spaceflight uh, will be discussed and hopefully decided. So congratulations for the timing. Um, I'd like to say that I concur to, my, uh, to what my colleagues uh, said, and I'd like maybe to complement uh, on other topics uh, which is to insist on the fact that at European level, and really at European level, we have all the expertise and capabilities to embark on, ambitious, on an ambitious space exploration programs in LEO, in lunar orbit, and on the moon. Uh, let's give to you uh, some example of what we, we did or what we are doing today. We have a group of very experienced astronauts that flying on non-European uh, systems. We have been working in the past, some time ago, on a, on a space plane, Hermes space plane, which has been completely designed, and some facilities have been invested to produce some parts of, uh, of Hermes. We have been developing in Europe uh, uh, reentry capsules, IRD. We have been developing the XV vehicle. Uh, Italy and ESA is developing to, today the space rider. Uh, and finally, we will have soon, hopefully, uh, a modernized uh, heavy lift launcher with Ariane 6. So we just have to put all that together to support that ambition, and this is clearly what France is, is supporting. Um, I'd like to say that certainly if we embark on such an ambition, we will do it differently to what we did before. Uh, it has to be more inclusive. Uh, we should have uh, uh, new entrants, startup participating to that. We should have, to our opinion, more competition between the different uh, actors. And certainly, we have to embark uh, all the society behind the, the adventure. So, so that's what we try to, uh, to, uh, to uh, explain to our authorities today. And basically, I think the role of agencies is to, to translate uh, such uh, very good ambition in two programs. That's what we are doing. I forgot to mention the task expertise in the space station. Sorry, Walter. But it's on top of that, and we are in Torino. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that brings us to... Yeah, but this is part of the vision Elena was... Uh, it's thanks to the vision of our government Elena was mentioned. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you for this introduction. <laughs> no, um, this report, I found a great report, giving the vision and giving where... where it's the first time I, I saw a clear vision from, uh, from Europe in the, last, in the recent year because we have lost a little bit of a, a, an ambition visions, a, a vision as Europe in the past. I would say that uh, Elena says it's timely arriving, yes, if, we, if from, from tomorrow we start the implementation. It's late in my view because I was expecting this vision when we, in 2011, we had the last flight to the ISS, so we complete ISS, because the vision and the preparation for, for a role, important role, Elena, you, you know better than I, should start years before. In the next thing you see at the American uh, or the other will be wh where they will be and where we will be in 10 years time. So it's important. And uh, one thing, uh, look into the title of our panel, Revolution on Space. I would say revolution on Earth because we have to change in Europe the mindset and the way to do business in the, co in the industry level in the institution if you want to, to implement uh, this, uh, this uh, report, if you want to have a role, because we, our experience as a company working in, all the com in the new initiative is that we have not the possibility to do the things that we as Europe we may, can do because we have to be subject to the decision of other big company or other big institution. If we don't move in the direction the report is showing, we will, uh, I will not least so quickly become just supplier as an industrial uh, industry in Europe. And even less than that, because if you are not investing then in technology, even as a supplier, it will be difficult. Uh, we are uh, changing at company level with the, big co other, uh, the other big company in Europe at this, uh, this uh, situation. 
So uh, is really I, I really congratulate uh, with the the people which uh, the panel which have uh, uh, wrote this uh, this report. But I we will uh, have a, a deeper discussion during the panel. I really hope that from tomorrow we go in that direction. And I will also say two comments, if I can, just shortly. One, I was expecting that this room to be full of students because the future of our students is what we decide in Europe in this day if we want to have a future for our young generation in the spaces, the future, the economy of spaces is the, the, really the, the opportunity for all our young generation. And, uh, and then see, we will see what uh, again uh, will uh, come out from this, but really expect that from uh, tomorrow this will become a real implementation. We, we cannot expect the next ministerial. If that this is not uh, the, the speed we need to, to be, uh, that's why I say that we need to change the mindset. We cannot go with the, the normal rules of uh, decision through ministerial if we want to implement uh, this vision. That's at least my, my view. Thank you, Walter. Very, very clear, and uh, I take the point, Revolution Earth. Uh, I could also say uh, Revolution Europe. In fact, uh, one of the titles in the competition uh, for the report was uh, Generation uh, Space. So it is about a generation. It's a generational thing, and it's about also the next generation and talent, I repeat that, it's, it's a key element. And you said speed is key, absolutely. So this brings us to Timo, please. Yeah. So thank you, Ludwig, and thank you, Jean-Jacques, for the invitation uh, to be here on this, uh, on this panel. And uh, from our side, I mean, this, this report is really an encouraging report. It, uh, I was really impressed by all the numbers and the red rope going through. Must have been the hell of work to get together opinions of a bunch of non-space people and then really bring a red rope and a clear message also uh, to, the, uh, to the public here. Um, and uh, it is really something where now rails are set the, within the next three, four, five years for the next 50 years. And I think this is a really very interesting time um, where uh, we all from the political side, from the institutional side, from the industrial side have to prepare for the future and have to see that we in Europe gain back on ground in this uh, very um, uh, exciting uh, future market because I heard once in, in the US on this a space symposium from a senator saying that uh, we start to move from a earth-centric uh, centric economy into a solar system-centric economy and I think this is really what's exactly hit the nail on its head. Um, there is something that is developed and Europe cannot, cannot step back. And it's like Walter said, it's for the young people. I mean, you are the guys who will be then be on the moon and test your experiments there or be even on Mars uh, and uh, uh, have a European flag there, hopefully with you. But there's one thing that uh, also Ludwig mentioned, I mean, and also some other panelists, there's the hell of money going into the systems in the US. And there's uh, also private investments in the US, which is super huge. And I think this is something we also have to see um, that when we speak about um, the development of this e economy, how industry will respond to it, but this is surely something in the next round. So it's uh, no tree grows into heaven, and there's also something where we have to see what's the, really the best reaction is from European industry also to cope with these things. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Timo, and uh, I think you said next 50 years, so this is not about three or five years. This is generational, in fact. Uh, DT. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I think we see actually a momentum which is not starting with this report. Um, I mean, the report has been triggered because there is a momentum. There is a momentum in, even in the, uh, at the level of society, in even uh, at the, let's say, the student level, so to say, this generation. Um, in 2009, we had uh, uh, barely 9,000 candidates uh, to become astronauts. This time, two years ago, one and a half, we had more than 24,000 candidates. And uh, this is, it is a momentum. Uh, the other momentum is um, in the current exploration program, 
we, were, we had a kind of flat budget for many years until 2000, well, including after 2016, roughly 500 million a year. It may look a lot of money for you, but it's not that much. Uh, if you divide this uh, at the European level, that's uh, less than a euro per, per citizen per year on the 1st of January. Um, so we went in 2019 uh, and we staggered up from 500 a year to 700 a year. Last year, we got up one step further. Uh, we're now close to a billion a year. So there is already this increase. Now the question is, of course, it's all fine if we keep this increase, it's just we don't need this report and we just go ahead. The situation is different. In this budget, in the current exploration budget, most of the budget goes into programs to support, sorry to say so, our friends in America, the US NASA program for exploration. Most of what we are doing is to support that program. So the question is, in the next 50 years, do we want to do this, uh, continue to do this? Yes, but we want to do more. And this is where we have to get into this mentality of non-dependence, which means also leadership. We are not used to have a mentality of leadership in Europe. And that is the issue. Over 60 years ago, there was, you know, it was a, probably a very easy discussion in the U.S. to go for a human spaceflight. The same was true in the USSR, and the same is true in, uh, for China today. They don't need years and years of discussion. The initiative of having more autonomy and having European human spaceflight is not from yesterday, not at this report. It also needs people. And it was the new uh, ESA Director General, Mr. Aschbacher, who put it in his Agenda 25 when he started on the first day his, 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 when he took office. And that a very strong commitment. So it needs also people at the right time. You know, you can have brilliant ideas if it's not the right time, if, you don't, if you're not in the momentum, uh, that doesn't work. So I think we are now in a wave and, I, and we have to surf on it. There will not be a second one. I'm sure. Yeah, thank you very much. And it is not a easy to jump on a wave once it's gone, right? It's really tough to catch up with the wave. And you said it's about leadership and maybe also to get from a reactive mode into an active and maybe even a proactive mode. And uh, this is also an appeal to the next generation. We try to give the impulse, but I think we need uh, the whole ecosystem to, to carry us forward. So. This was a short introduction, and I would really like to jump quickly into a round of more specific questions to each of you. Again, Elena, I would like to start with you. As, the, as I said, uh, I would like to say the, the policy representative on the panel. Um, how do European states, and in particular Italy, see the coexistence of what are bilateral agreements, Artemis, where from the American side there is a lot of engagement with individual players, including opportunities for astronauts to fly? and what is what the report advocates an own European ambition. Thank you, thank you Ludwig. I think it's a very pertinent question, in particular to, to a representative of, uh, of Italy because uh, in our country we are masters uh, of this mix of multilateral and bilateral agreement. Now, this, the coexistence of these two methods is not new. It's something that uh, we have uh, applied uh, since many, many years, and not only in human spaceflight. We have uh, multilateral and bilateral agreement in science, in Earth observation. But just to give you two examples, which are really glamorous examples of, of the past in human spaceflight, we have, as Italy, participated through ESA uh, to the Space Lab program, for instance, but we have also had a multi bilateral mission, and I was thinking, just looking here at our astronaut, Franco Malerba, uh, which was a NASI mission using a space lab facility, and it was a bilateral mission with the U.S. But the even more uh, interesting case certainly is the space station. In the space station program, we participate through ESA. We have participated through ESA and built a lot of expertise with the, with the Columbus, with the nodes. But at the same time, we have also developed a bilateral uh, type of agreements uh, only with the U.S. And through these agreements, we have got a lot back. Uh, this was uh, the MPLM, uh, the PMM, 
And uh, among the many return of this bilateral investment, there has been also astronaut flights. So the, I would say that the two methods are complementary and we should not see them one against the other. Uh, there are advantages in both cases. Uh, in the case of the multilateral type of agreement, uh, as a country you do, uh, whenever you are, you are playing the game through ISAD, uh, for example, you are participating to programs uh, which have a technological complexity, a cost and a risk that would not allow you to, to be there as a leader on your own. And probably what is even more interesting, it allows you to build and express a European position and a vision and build a roadmap in a certain sector, like the exploration sector, that then becomes the, the basis for all our national activities and also that gives us force uh, on, the global, uh, on the global ground. So it is, uh, they're very, very important, this program. On the other side, the bilateral programs are equally important because they leverage on the expertise that our industry has built up and we have learned on this and, uh, and it's functioning very, very well. I'm sure that uh, Walter uh, could say much more than me about this. But there is also another element and this is particularly linked to the human space flight uh, world and sector. Bilateral agreement, uh, they reinforce and they give high visibility to the strategic geopolitical alliances. And, uh, and uh, I mean, this is a, an audience of mostly Italian, you're all reading the Italian papers, you know that the uh, alliance with the US is one of the key strategic alli alliances of the country. So I think we should not see the two things uh, uh, in contradiction one with the other. We can work very well with both. Uh, we can live with Artemis bilateral um, agreements and we can live with a European ambitious exploration program. And, uh, and this is what we are looking uh, uh, forward to. Uh, what I would find actually more, if I may, uh, more interesting is not really a discussion about the multilateral and bilateral agreement, rather a discussion on the role of the institution and the private, also in human space flight, and in particular uh, when it comes to the ownership of uh, uh, private entities of uh, strategic infrastructure. This is a very important theme that uh, we will have to deal with uh, one of these days. Yes, in fact, and this could be a panel in its own. Absolutely. How the public and the private should coexist and avoid dependencies and ensure some level of autonomy. Um, I would have a second. Uh, first of all, I, I take it that uh, there's a coexistence between bilateral and multilateral. Uh, I hope that this also means that uh, we can have the support on the two sides. So. We have a critical mass for also the European action. Um, maybe just as a, um, a, a final question to you, uh, when you look at the report and it talks about societal, economic and geopolitical benefits, is there a particular one you would like to stress? I mean, all three are there and important. Is there one that you would highlight? No, I, I don't think, I think it's, uh, you know, all three, it's a very well, the report is very, very, very well written. It's very difficult to, to find any, uh, anything that could be disputed. I think the, the, the benefits are undisputable. Uh, there is, there is a, a growing uh, low Earth orbit, moon, outer space economy. This economy will, will bring wealth, will bring prosperity, will inspire the future generation. And certainly being a, a leading actor into these uh, new endeavors will make us sit at the table with much more power whenever we have to discuss the governance of these programs and the regulation, which is a very, very important aspect of it. So I don't really have uh, a preference. There is not one that, uh, that would strike uh, out of the three. Uh, what I would like to add, and this has nothing to do with the benefits, and I have to say, giving the credits to those who have written the report, because they've done it with uh, intellectual honesty, uh, there is a question, there is an open question that remains, and it is about the political priority about, uh, of a program like this one when uh, uh, we are facing uh, extreme challenges in climate insecurity. And I think that this is a, a very uh, important debate that uh, we have to face in the coming months. Uh, to arrive at, uh, at a conclusion on, uh, on whether we can really afford and go forward with this, uh, with this uh, uh, beautiful and visionary program. 
And I think we need to arrive also at a true conclusion and not a half conclusion. There is nothing worse than a half decision. And I think this is also what we have heard before. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And maybe a remark on this. Uh, in the US, it is clear that uh, a competitive industrial base is part of security policy. It is important to have your own supply to do the things you want to do or you need to do when you need to do them without having to revert to some other that may give you a system or service or not. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think you said uh, sit on the table with more power. Um, I think it's an argument to be made and I believe the report does it. Um, it is about autonomy for cooperation. It is not autonomy to be isolated and do things ourselves. It is to just have own capabilities and an element that gives you a, a seat on the table and some negotiation power when it comes to it. I think this is an important element and I think you, you resonated that. And if I may add on this, the question will be that there is autonomy on many sectors and, uh, and uh, there, is, uh, there are tables on many different topics and we will have to choose the right one. Yes, thank you very much. And I would like to move on to uh, Wolfgang. Um, and we get into uh, in a more industrial perspective. Um, a key element of the report is it's, it's not just about money. It is also about how it will be put to best use. And uh, there is a strong emphasis on transformation of the whole ecosystem. That is true for the public side, certainly. It is also true for the uh, industry side and uh, Jean-Jacques uh, Dordain in the introduction, uh, I think this is about also uh, other uh, parts of the ecosystem, startups, young talent to, to be brought uh, on the table. Uh, what is your read in this? How will you accommodate this? Are you ready to transform? Uh, absolutely. We are ready to transform and we have to transform. Uh, beside the geopolitical relevance, which was already addressed, um, space and uh, the upcoming uh, exploration economy on the moon and probably beyond uh, is also a big market. And when you see how the market grew over the last years, we are currently on 400 to 450 billion revenues euro per year. This is addressed in the report. And uh, the expectation is that we are growing until 2040 up to 1 trillion, 1 trillion euro revenues per year. And uh, Europe has to find ways to participate in this economy, to have a share, and also, uh, which also brings beside uh, a strong geopolitical power or position, uh, also uh, prosperity in Europe. And so, therefore, it is important uh, to find the way, uh, the right way to address this. What we experienced over the last years, all of us, especially the big LSIs, which are part of uh, big, uh, especially transatlantic projects, are that we are inherently capable with our technologies. We have very good technologies which are acknowledged, which are needed in, in big, uh, uh, projects, especially uh, also from NASA. We have prominent uh, examples with the Artemis uh, mission. Uh, one is the Gateway, where we are participating very well. Uh, with TASI, we are uh, participating in the uh, Orion missions, uh, the Artemis 1 mission. Uh, we from Airbus with the European Service Module. Also a joint venture. It's not just one company, it's always uh, a partnering of, of, the, of the big uh, companies in Europe, but also with a lot of SMEs all contributing to that. So we are really capable with our technologies and um, we are an excellent contributor across, uh, uh, across the, the value chain. It's not just in space exploration. I mentioned our team is uh, Mars Sample Return is one we saw a nice uh, movie today and this big satellite, it is the uh, Earth return orbiter uh, is produced in Europe. It's under ESA responsibility with European industry as the prime contractor and we are very proud of being part of this important mission and we will do our job also in this mission as we have done in the RTMS-1. 
We have also interesting science missions like uh, the Grace, like James Webb, where we contributed. And it was interesting that the US relied on a European launch on Ariane 5 to launch this very important project, which was built up over decades, more or less, with a two-digit billion figure behind it. And it was on a single launch on Ariane 5, which went at the end perfectly. So there's a lot of trust in Europe. And therefore, we can say we are an excellent contributor across the entire value chain. But we are a contributor. And we do not have a lot of autonomy in launching our topics. We, you see, uh, or as we experienced, uh, we will have the last Ariane 5 launch coming up soon. Uh, Ariane 6 is in the pipeline, yes. Um, but we, when we see the broader scope of uh, uh, space logistics and transportation, which is an essential part of this human space flight, we are a little bit behind in capabilities, in autonomous capabilities in Europe. And therefore, it's very important that we gain independent capabilities, but not as a, a competition to the US or to others, it's complementary to their capabilities. And international cooperation does not just mean that we have to contribute with, with uh, uh, technologies or with, with parts of the entire value chain. It could be also contribute with a full-fledged um, uh, part of the, entire, of the entire value chain, meaning if you have independent capabilities, this can be also brought uh, to uh, the international cooperation. We need uh, a better, in Europe, a uh, much better approach on the commercial side um, since so far we uh, were very heavily dependent more or less on uh, institutional contracts in space exploration. We have the barter mechanisms which worked well over the last years, but when you see how the landscape is currently changing in the US, especially that uh, NASA is more and more transferring capabilities responsibilities from their own, from owing systems to industry, which, who is now capable to do so, commercial crew, commercial cargo. Uh, post ISS is a big topic currently, where they are putting money into industry to get programs started, to get ideas, to unlock innovation, unlock also a lot of investors' money, attract private investors to provide their money to these big um, uh, to these big projects and then transfer responsibilities also to industry to have money available uh, for focusing on other areas uh, which are also important and with the limited budget which is available everywhere we cannot do everything and therefore that what can be done by industry should be done by industry and this is currently very heavily driven by the US, uh, also by some big uh, private investors like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, which we have been already mentioned, who put a lot of money, also own money, spend own money in these capabilities and which are also heavily backed at the end by the government. And therefore we have also to transform in Europe in that direction that we can unlock this innovation potential uh, in industry, not just in the big LSIs, but also in uh, the big uh, startup scene, which is also there, maybe not that visible in Europe than uh, as in the US, but it is there, and we have to further uh, push and, and, and support this. Uh, investments is a big topic, which we could also unlock in Europe, and we have to do so. And one uh, big, uh, um, um, for transatlantic, um, one, one example for, for uh, a current transatlantic project or, uh, is, is the, as I mentioned, the post-ISS. Uh, when you see for uh, decades, uh, NASA owed the International Space Station. There was, this was a big project for international cooperation. We also had our share on that, but this will have an end most probably in 2030, as it is currently planned. And then uh, NASA is uh, counting on industry, which is currently already developing uh, follow-up stations, commercial stations, 
in a first phase of the so-called CDFF program. It's the Commercial Leo Destinations Free Flyer program, uh, where three companies uh, got money out of the CDFF program. In addition, Axiom did already uh, an, a separate program with uh, NASA to start building up commercial space stations. And NASA will probably decide in 2025 when the uh, critical design reviews are done on which companies, maybe on all, maybe just on one or two, I guess a, 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 a minimum of two will be selected. They already select like they did with commercial crew and cargo, a kind of pre-selection for further service, for future services, which could start in 2028, 2029 timeframe. So time is running and uh, the ISS is retiring, commercial stations are coming up and when we look into Europe, what we are currently doing or where, where we are, we are a little bit behind on that. And therefore we really have to act now and see what is our position on that. Do we want to have a known capability? Do we have to, do, do, do we want to step in? Do we have to build up a, a kind of commercial transatlantic partnership on that? And therefore, this is also a big transformation process on both sides, on the institution sides, also on the industry side. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, one could argue that what really made the change in the US, uh, those rockets that fly, uh, and maybe some of the commercial Leo companies, they are new companies. So uh, there, there is an argument to be made how existing uh, industries and new industries will come together in best uh, synergy. And uh, I think this is a big challenge. Uh, we, we do not have the same mechanisms. We also do not have the same private capital in Europe, and we do not have the billionaires that, that go for it. So the equation is, is more complex. Um, I would like to jump, because I know we have uh, some time constraints, I think Timo and also Didier. If I can allow myself to, to give the word, maybe we go to Timo first. Um, before we go back in the normal sequence, uh, maybe Timo and Didier. Uh, basically, Timo, the same question for you. Are you ready to transform? What is missing? Do we have everything? It's fine. Can we co-invest? Are you going to conquer the market? Do you do a commercial deal? What, what is the plan? Yeah, for yeah, yeah. you know, I mean, industry is always prepared to transform if there is a market and if, and if the market is, is visible. And here we, we know there will be a market coming some, sometimes. But uh, the question is really when uh, the return of investment can be can be generated, and I think this is. I'm, I mean, I'm working for a, a, a family-run company, and you know that family-run companies usually usually think very on sustainability and and really more on a on a more conservative approach. And uh, there's really the question. Um, yes, there's there are things going on. We all heard that U.S. has uh, put a lot of money, uh, one order, uh, 15 times as much money as, as, as Europe on the table. They have private investments and they are companies which have a long breath. So Jeff Bezos invests each year $1 billion into his company. So this brings him on number nine on the level of space agencies in, in, in terms of amount space agencies do spend. And I think this is really a high economic power and he does not really care if, uh, if there's really uh, tomorrow coming directly uh, a return. Other companies do care. And I think this is a question one has to really look at uh, and therefore uh, we have a little bit uh, concern with this early investments in this stage into infrastructure where we, where we don't see when the return will come. It is not of doubt that it is necessary that Europe uh, de develops uh, independency in selected areas and we, we go on developing and we are jumping also onto this train because we don't want to miss the wave. That's super clear. But in Europe, we have, uh, like uh, also Wolfgang mentioned, we have really specialities. We don't have to hide. I mean, we, we have really something to offer. We are in, in technologies. We are very diverse and, and we are really uh, clever. Uh, so the question is from total autonomy, this is one side, to total dependent in terms of cooperation. And somewhere in, the, in, in this field, maybe more to total autonomy, more to the own investment, we have to think that uh, we, we're going to settle ourselves. And 
from our side, from OHB side, we are super prepared to transfer. But like I said, it's the question when the market comes and, 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 and how, how close you believe that there will be a return of investment coming in, in a certain, certain point in, uh, in, in time. Yeah, um, people would probably argue this is not a commodity, so it's not a single something you, you there is a market uh, established. So a lot of this new space endeavor is about taking risks on markets to be. Yes, investing into the future, and we talk about generational things. Yeah, we, we know that return and invest is something that uh, is a concern not only for family-run business; it's also stock market quoted uh, companies. It's it's uh, not so dissimilar, but there is a different dynamic in the U.S. We need to find a way, and industry needs to yes. challenge itself more than what we see right now. I think this is. If this isn't part of it, um, I don't think the report will will fly with politicians if we miss on the transformation. That's what one point, Ludwig. The amount of investment in these developments is is very high. So this is, is very clear. If you develop a new rocket, if you develop uh, new transport vehicles, and if it's a crude transport vehicle, it's really a, a high investment you're going. And that, that was the reason why I'm saying on which level you're, you're playing. I mean, if it's a Jeff Bezos level or if it's uh, another level of, 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 uh, of the companies in yes. Europe. Yeah? And it's maybe a question also, what is the right policy incentive to help people taking risks on the private yes. side? That's, that's uh, really because the question. Because this is an element also in the US. They are a few years ahead in this mechanics. And uh, I hope there is a, also uh, a, a dialogue between the private and the public how this should be approached. Uh, it's a key element. Um, with this, uh, Didier, I would like to, to come to you before you, I think you will have to leave us in 20 minutes or so. Um, the report at the end uh, makes a clear call for ESA. It's not a report for ESA, by the way. It's a report for policymakers, for policy decision-making on highest level. But it is on the table of ESA because ESA is an enabler and uh, ESA with industry and, and other agencies um, shall put together what are the steps to really shape this. So when in November this comes to a space summit, that there is a better understanding what this is about, including also maybe a price tag and how transformation of the system would go. Maybe you can elaborate on this, uh, Didier. Um, yeah, indeed. I mean, first of all, ESA has a kind of triennial uh, mode of uh, financing, uh, which culminates with a ministerial conference. The last one was last November. It takes my team 18 months to prepare a ministerial conference uh, of this kind for the last ministerial, so it was 18 months. In the same 18 months, China did 11 flights to assemble their own space station. So we were talking for 18 months for a 700 million increase in budget with 22 member states, and they had every five weeks they had a launch to assemble a space station. Um, next year, China will be number four uh, to have their autonomous capabilities to bring uh, their own astronauts into, into low Earth orbit, and they have quite significant plans to go ahead um, uh, thereafter. So the question is really, how do we correct this, let's say, historical anomaly where Europe is number three as an economic power um, and we're, we're not in the, in the picture? So um, it has actually started, um, the, I mean, the, the real ticking the clock was, was uh, starting uh, on the 16th of uh, uh, February last year with a space summit in uh, Toulouse. A space summit has to be at the head of state and, 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 and government. And this is where we are today. What we talk about here, and it has been said, is more than a space program. It's more than an exploration program. It is much beyond. And that's why we need heads of government and, and heads of state to give the green light and to push for this inspirational initiative. Otherwise, we could do our regular triannual, uh, you know, uh, council conferences with ministers and deciding uh, with the Minister of Economy and Science and God knows who um, on, on a regular basis. We have to, uh, and we did, we are elevating this. Now, last year it has been decided um, with the impulse of President Macron to say, look into it. So he said to the Director General of ESA, look into it. 
and, uh, and this is the report which came out. Now, the next step is on the 6th and 7th of November in Sevilla. It, there is another space summit. Um, I can tell you to have a space summit every year is already a hurdle. <laughs> um, and on the 6th afternoon, this will be on the topic, will be the topic of discussion. There is a little minor discussion on launchers. <laughs> Uh, but okay, this will be the thing. Now, we have to make sure altogether um, that we have these heads of states and government present. This is the challenge that we have. We know how to do things uh, with national uh, space agencies, national programs, ESA programs. We know how to do it. We know even what to do. The problem is and that is a recurrent problem we have with 22 uh, member states, is what comes back all the time is why. It's not even what and how, it's why should we do it. And if you have 22 countries, the why can be very, very different from one country to another because of cultural aspects, political aspects, uh, historical aspects. And this is where we do have a difficult job because it's, I don't know if you know the expression herding cats, you know, getting 22 cats together all the time, that's quite difficult. Jean-Jacques knows about this. Um, so, and this is where we have this very, very uh, specific moment. There is only one bullet in the, in the cannon and that's on the 6th of November. There's no other chance. So I also count on industry, I count of course on the national, uh, 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 we can call it lobby, why not, uh, to make this happen. And every country will take what they want from the report. The report has a lot of answers about the why we should do this and so on. Everybody can say, okay, for my minister it's more science, for my economy ministers it's more about economy, for my foreign affairs minister it's more about uh, uh, posture, uh, about soft power and so on and so forth. Um, doesn't matter, we have a panoply of reasons why we should do it. Everybody can take what he wants from the menu, that's not the problem. But all together, this is where we have to, we have to start. It will start on the 6th of November. I'm quite positive about it. I can tell you it's not every day. <laughs> um, but this is, where, this is where we stand. We have to correct, uh, say again, this historical anomaly of Europe not being able to have its, its own decision-making system and its own capacity. You've said it before, it's not because we just want to play on our own courtyard alone. By augmenting these capa capabilities, be it to Moon, uh, uh, including future Mars, and of course, first step is, is low Earth orbit, we will be able to be a much better partner with our uh, American friends but we will decide how and when we do things. And this is very essential. It is beneficial for them, it is beneficial for us. Uh, can you maybe elaborate if there is any work in the background um, specifically on, say, the business model, how agencies and industries would put this together in a new approach? Um, yeah, of course, we're working on many fronts, uh, and, and, and this is one. Uh, we have to make, as I just said, 22 countries, 22 different kind of approaches, and you can rank 10 different reasons, uh, they're ranked differently. So we have to work on all, on all of these issues. Um, and of course, the issue where everybody looks into it is this commercial aspect, this uh, uh, new space aspect, and so on. Um, uh, not missing the train for this business to come. Now we have to be careful because you know bubbles are existing and so on. So it shall not be the central point. It is a mix. It's like the mayonnaise. You have different ingredients and one, one, once it works, it works. So it is a mix of things. We have to look at the political side, at the economical side, at the societal side, uh, the, you know, inspiration, science and so on. It is this mix, and that is what makes Europe different from many others. In the US, there is no discussion like this, you know. They just say, 
we do this for national posture, for science, and for inspiration, full stop. Agreed? Okay, next topic. Um, and that's at the level of the White House. A a and this is how the policy is made. We are, you know, elaborating, and, uh, and, and when things work practically, uh, somebody says, but does it work theoretically? Um, that's a little bit Europe, you know. Um, so now let's, let's just do it. That's what I'm saying. Let's just go and push for it. So on many fronts and get the right mix, uh, the interesting question will be if, and, and this is a European constraint de facto, um, the interesting question ultimately then will be in November, if you look at the American model, it's completely different, disruptive. You have one walking in and making all the difference basically. Uh, not asking too many questions on when the return on investment comes, but believing in, in the substantial change. And I think we need to find also that ingredient in our storyline. Otherwise, it is an evolution and it may not fly. If it's a revolution, I mean, revolutions are disruptive. So, Yeah, and, and even in the U.S., I would add that it is also more than a space program, obviously, in the U.S. The Department of Transport is fully behind. The Department of Economy is behind. The DOD is behind. Department of Energy is behind because of nuclear, nuclear energy uh, fission reactors on the moon. So this, the whole government, so to say, in the US is behind this. Um, so, and I mentioned the defense. We should not be shy, it's even written in the, in the report, about saying that space exploration, human and, and, and robotic, it has also a security and defense angle. It's not up to ESA to do this. It's up to the member states. But we can be there to build these bricks, the technology bricks and so on, so that member states in their prerogative about security and defense can then elaborate further. Yes, absolutely. And it would be a point for Elena for another session to come, how this policy debate, which in fact uh, concerns many ministries, can be brought forward. I think it's a, it's a key element. Uh, with this, uh, DT, I think you will be leaving soon and I will just anticipate, keep the mic just one sec. The one final statement you would want to give to the audience, what is your main message when you walk out here that people should keep and help to make things happen? Uh, when the sun is back, just look at the moon and say, we will, we will get there. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you. That's visionary, right? Um, and maybe you do the same because you will have to leave also, uh, I give you the, uh, the advance opportunity for that. So what is your message to the audience? So this is really challenging times and I'm convinced uh, there will be um, new, uh, super interesting programs for science and for the future. So in the future is yours. Okay. Um, Jean-Marc, if we go back to our sequence and we have to excuse our two travelers, do you go into space or you? First to the air. First to the air, first step. Um, so Jean-Marc, the question here really is um, how the message resonates in CNES and uh, also in particular in, in France beyond the space community. We know that uh, your president is at the, at the beginning of the initiative in a way from the previous summit and it would be interesting to hear your perspective. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> to answer to your question, maybe I'd like to summarize a little bit the, <coughs> the question that we have today. I think the question is basically, will Europe embark now in an ambitious program to have a permanent independent presence on the moon? Uh, this is the question which is, uh, which is uh, put. Uh, to address that, we have to answer to the question why, what, and how we do it. I think the why answers are given in Ashlag report. Uh, it is very well explained, and it has been explained by non-space specialists, because if you ask to space specialists, of course, we all here would like to embark on such a mission, uh, industry and agencies, if we have the budget to do, uh, to do so. So it has been answered by non-space uh, specialists, and it's quite convincing, I have to say. Uh, maybe the, the why answers will be different uh, among the European countries. Maybe the reasons for Italy, for Germany, or for France, are different, but if the answer is yes, we do, uh, no matter. Uh, so I think uh, this, this first question is to be addressed, uh, of course, at the political level, but assuming it is yes, we do, then we have the what question, what to do. And 
it has been seen in this panel that we all agree about the capacities that we have in Europe to do so. But certainly, we all disagree today what to do. If I ask Walter what to do, he will most certainly answer a space station. <laughs> if I, if I uh, ask to my other uh, neighbor, maybe some di different things. So I think there is a big job to do what to do to embark on such a vision. Um, in CNES, we have defined 10 technological objectives to do so, starting with cargo in the hall, cargo on the moon, uh, human rating of Ariane 6, uh, then the space station, uh, permanent European habitat on, on the moon, uh, nuclear production on the moon, and so on, and so on, and so on. So there is a catalog of activities to be done which are all necessary to go to the ultimate goal. But we should start. We should start by something. So by what we, we start? Uh, to decide that, uh, I'm sorry, but we do not have to wait for uh, November. November is too late. November is a decision process. We have to start it now. So we have started that process in France. I have to say that it is um, <coughs> seen up to the highest level. And so we are ready to, to engage discussion with our European partners to, do, to decide on what to do. And then you have your how, how we do it. Uh, certainly it's important, but let's first decide what we can do in the coming years to be concrete, to start this very ambitious program. I don't know if this is the answer to your question, but... Uh... Uh, yes, so we are clear on the why. We, we heard that the why is different for many countries, we heard that indeed, which is a complexity. Um, France know what to do, and we're not so sure for no, the how. No, no. No, without no. the how, no. it is... We, we, we know what we can discuss. I mean, all is open, yes. but we need discussion. Uh, I think um, the impression one could get from the discussion is that the, the how, which includes the transformative element, is, is something that is um, maybe the biggest challenge at the end. And um, so that really brings me maybe to the second question for you, Jean-Marc. Uh, there is a little time window, so there is one, one moonshot, if you like, in November. Um, what can agencies, in particular agencies, space agency, do between now and then to put the right points and clarification and proposals into the policy process and get a positive decision? We should do our job. <laughs> Our job is clearly, as I said, to transform an ambition into a program. A program means uh, to define a goal, uh, to define a timing, uh, to define a budget, and then to defend it. And this is what, uh, what we have to do in Europe. Uh, I'd like also to say that um, um, we have seen that we all agree here, but in reality in Europe, uh, we know that in the space sector we are able to do very bright things like the JUICE missions, but we are also able to, you know, to disagree on, uh, on tiny things like launchers and things like that. And in reality, exploration, space exploration, is certainly a unique opportunity to unify space sector in Europe. So uh, I think we, we should really take this opportunity now, because in two years from now it will be too late, and maybe it's already too late uh, today, to, um, to unify Euro Europe in, uh, in the space sector. And if we do not do so, we, we, we know that we, are, we have many reasons not to unify. So let's do it now. Now, now the, uh, the question was in plural in terms of space agencies, and it may be different in different agencies. And there may be some when you say it's a matter of defining a program, they may start to say, I have another program which is more important, and if it's an either or, I go for the other. So there is a true question that um, at the end, if the impression is that in doing exploration, you lose somewhere else, and the overall envelope of programs doesn't change, it is unlikely that uh, you get the consensus across the, the, the major Agencies. Yeah, obviously, I think um, we all agree that we cannot do that uh, at, at constant budget. So uh, that can only be done if we decide, if the political level decide to increase the budget. I think we, we all agree on, on that. So we should not trade uh, such a program with other programs. Um, at least this is a message we pass in France. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Walter, um, I'm sorry, but uh, last but not least, and uh, we know that you have lots of capability already in orbit and in the making. You are also very active across the ocean. Um, it would be interesting to see your perspective and, and maybe also in, in particular in your case, um, simplified somebody could say, I'm an industry, I get contracts, they come from elsewhere. Uh, I, I have revenues from some American commercial Leo contract and the likes versus to, to see also something on the European side. And, and maybe you can explain a bit the, this duality and your perspective on it. Yeah, I, I, uh, I just come back to what Elena was saying because when we, she, she was talking about uh, ESA project and bilateral project, we have the ability to, to, uh, to be partner of a US company because of ESA investment and because of Italian investment on the bilateral agreement. Without this investment, we would not have developed the capability that now allow us to be a player worldwide. Uh, and this is very important because uh, uh, otherwise you cannot have private investment to cover all the, the need uh, of techno development technology for sp uh, space business. And uh, in the other end, uh, also coming back, what Wolf Wolfgang was saying, also Jean-Marc, about uh, unification of European space activity, because today with a very small budget, because the European, we never talk about that, but the European budget uh, overall, in respect to the American one, is peanuts. No? We all know this. If we want to, to be ambitious, uh, we have to increase the budget. And we are competing. We are. Uh, three, four big companies competing against each other for a small budget where our competition should be outside Europe, all right? And uh, to be uh, really a leader outside uh, Europe, a competitor outside Europe, we need to have ambition project in Europe which unify with political direction, which unify and give a clear direction also to all uh, industrial uh, uh, industrial chain. That is very important in my view. Uh, today we are leader, I was saying before, we are leader in many areas today. Tomorrow we can be nothing. If we, we not grow, we cannot keep uh, on going with the other. And while we are discussing Europe, the other are moving qu uh, fast and quick in, the, in, the, in all direction. That's why I was saying that the, the report is great, but is even late unless we start immediately to, do a, to have a clear implementation of this. I would like also to come back to one thing because it's nice to read on paper what we are able to do, but tomorrow, uh, when in the 2028 the ISS will be the condition and uh, the commission, and we don't have any infrastructure in Europe to get on, on even on a lower earth. We don't have transportation system and we don't have a plan as Europe, how to get there. Unless we do partnership, we pay the transport from private company in US or we pay the utilization of commercial code, which is good for us as a company because we are developing this. But looking at this as a European, I think is a little bit uh, uh, a poor situation. If we go to the moon, it's almost, it's not that much different because as Europe, we have the biggest program we have is the Argonaut EL3, which is a cargo, a cargo which will supply a US infrastructure. So when I was talking that uh, this, is, this paper is giving a, a great vision, uh, and I am saying at the same time it's late because uh, today there are uh, infrastructure and the vision from other country, which are, uh, I will not say clear because they are changing the direction uh, every day, but at least the end result, uh, the end objective is, is clear. So uh, in my view, and also to, 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 be, to remain on the market as a company, we need a strong political support from the, uh, our national agency, from our European agency, in order that we can keep the right level to, uh, to be a, a um, I, I would not say because I don't like the, this terminology, but to be at least a supplier. 
because if we don't have ambition program uh, from, from Europe, the only remaining uh, option for us to grow, uh, to make business, is to, to, to supply what are our capability to others that are having a vision and they, they know where to go. Yes. Very, very so, uh, if I would say a word, because for Europe, in my view, it's now or never. It, it, I, I agree, it's not even November. We, <laughs> we, we should uh, have a clear, uh, a clear uh, target already now and have discussion how to get to, get to the start. The November could be just something which put uh, the, the, the vision together, but even we cannot wait every three years a, a ministerial saying what we have to do. Yes. Um, I think we will have to come to a close. Uh, I will just make a remark on what you said and, and in fact, uh, Jean-Marc just said before, to unify. It was about unify the European ecosystem or the to get the European uh, industrial capability together to be strong as Europe and then compete globally. I think this is a, a key element. It is still not quite clear how we get there. I hope there is work between now and November, it's uh, time to be used. So I would like to conclude um, and give each of you really a short moment as we did for the two gentlemen. We start with Elena on what is the one thing you would like people to take home. Thank you, Ludwig. I, you know, I'm, I'm not very good at one, one short uh, statement, so I, I just make it a, a little bit longer if you allow me. I, I just wanted to tell you this is more on a personal side. I started more than 30 years ago to work in space and I started in human space flight. And I was, I certainly had this ideal that uh, this sector would bring for sure wealth, prosperity, but also, and I think this was my driver, a united Europe and peace. And I think that, uh, you know, throughout all the years I've worked in human space flight and also beyond, it has never failed me. And I'm absolutely convinced that uh, human space uh, exploration, exploration activities bring wealth, bring prosperity, but also bring peace. And this is extremely important and vital for all of us beyond the ideals. Now I've moved uh, uh, in my life and I'm now in a position in which I'm looking at the world in a little bit different way. Of course, uh, uh, I sit at the table where I realize that even for a country like Italy, which as you know, has invested an enormous amount of money in space. For Italy, space is extremely important at the national level, European level, in the recovery fund. Well, it's, uh, we have invested a lot, but it's never enough. And you realize that uh, when you sit at the table of the politicians that there are many priorities. Migration is a priority, security is a priority, climate is a priority. And therefore, if I can conclude, really my hope is that we are able to look beyond and really to look all together and arrive at defining this uh, big ambition together. But it will not be easy, but I really hope so. Very well. Wolfgang. A short last statement. Um, so uh, it is very important that we are positioning ourselves now in this changing environment. So we Airbus are ready to do so. We are ready to transform and we are fully behind the Human Spaceflight Inspirator Program in full support of ESA and of the governments who, who want to wanna do something in, in that area. Um, what is very important is the why we should do that, to convince our politicians, and this is what we have to do together, and this is what I want to underline. We really have to convince our, our governments, our politicians who are at the end deciding if we are going on this ambition, if we are spending money, if we are uh, wanna, wanna position ourselves in this area, that we explain why we wanna do it, why it is important to do so, and why they should positively vote for it at the next space summit, and then we can start transforming industry, transforming our procedures, what we have to do, and then we will do it. I'm convinced that we will have a strong position in future, we, Europe, in this human space flight uh, area. So much. Thank you. <coughs> I'd like to repeat what I said before. I think um, an ambitious European uh, space exploration program is a unique opportunity uh, for Europe and for space to unify. I think we are lacking maybe in space some success stories, uh, but not so many. So that one can be a very uh, important success uh, story. So let's start uh, to build it together. 
and Walter. Uh, I think personally, I will make a final statement, but it depends that the, the comp, uh, industrial transformation should start immediately because as uh, I think Elena mentioned that, uh, I think you, there are no big companies which are in, in the front of the new space economy. I mean, there are a new company like SpaceX, Blue Origin, but the big company have a, a lot of difficulty to, to, to catch up with this uh, new. Uh, and uh, as, as some big company like Lockheed are doing some spin-off in order to be able to, 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 to stay. So I think that as well in Europe, we have to think about this. In the other, uh, about the priority, Elena, I guess that the space, I, I fully agree that, that they are the, these are other priority, but uh, I am sh convinced that all our space exploration objective can answer to each of these, or can help to answer to each of these priority. Uh, climate, climate change, uh, immigration, or, or whatever. And uh, more than that is the only escape for, our, uh, for the new generation. Right. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like uh, to invite everybody for a round of applause to the panelists and close the panel. Thank you.